What do you believe are the minimum requirements for a company company to begin the journey to production harmonization? And that's given out to everybody. Anybody want to jump in on that one? Um, sure. Um, I'm not sure where the catch question came from, and typically it comes from a, a technical point of view. Is my factory ready from, from the technology? Do I have you know uh, cabling and internet in my factory? But I think that uh, that direction can often be misleading. I think the, the readiness factor <coughs> comes from the uh, from the DNA of the organization uh, and the uh, resulting change managed. Tara and Andreas mentioned as well. Are we ready for, for that uh, technology? And we see a lot of organizations out there that are ready. They're ready in the sense that they have been doing it for decades. And you know, uh, every year or every decade, they, they've been out there adopting the latest and greatest. But I think the number one question um, is if, if you're ready or not, is if you, have you really found a problem that is worth solving? And to address his comment, we go to customers and in many cases we ask, so, you know, hi, we're Platain, and, and how can we help? And the guy there says, well, you know, I'm not really sure, but management told me to do something with this AI thing. And okay, well, hang on. <laughs> uh, then <laughs> to address the question, then you are not ready. And you know, like, like with anything, what's the business pain? What's, what's the problem statement? You know, are you trying to improve your throughput, your yield on materials, your quality, whatever it is? And then, okay, let's see if this technology or, or another is, is suitable to address it. So when, when I discuss readiness uh, of, of these new technologies, it's, it's hardly ever the technical gaps. These gaps are, are more easily addressed. It's, it's um, these come more from the business, um, the business case, which eventually if you don't solve there, it's not gonna happen. But also from the DNA of the organization, how ready it is to accept this new evolution. And while everyone is different, what's the plan? Do you have a plan in place for this change management? And, and who are you talking to and, and for the earlier comments as well? Does anybody else wanna comment? Yeah, I, I could comment on that a little. I. I think that there's a lot of reasons why people would want to move into the change management piece, but most of it, I think, is a lot of times they're not really aware of things that could be improved and changed, but they haven't. There's things that are happening on the line, and then there's, for example, the parts go through metrology later at some point in time, and they see trends and things. So you have a bunch of IT people and quality people seeing things that are happening. But they, how do you affect it right on the ground when the parts are being made? And it's making that gap. They don't realize that <clears throat> there are ways to solve this problem and what's available. A lot of times I get the questions of like, well, we didn't even realize that you could do something that basic and that simple. And I think that the way to get it is you gotta find low hanging fruit that will motivate people to try to make that change. And then they get the buy-in from the cultural aspect of it. It has to, you, I don't think you could come in with a big, grandiose, you know, change plan. I mean, you can, if, I guess, if senior management is ready for that. But a lot of times, it's usually low-hanging fruit, things that'll provide value very quickly. While you're doing that, they wind up learning what other capabilities are out there and tend to grow in that direction. Great. Okay, let's go ahead and take the next question. Um, when considering the adoption of new manufacturing technologies, such as AI, IoT, how does one get started? Uh, it's almost related to the last question. What are the steps that need to be taken? What do you recommend? Um, so perhaps to extend that, yeah, the, the first thing to do is, you know, what are you trying to do? Ask yourselves. Um, and, and look for something that on the one hand is, is low-hanging fruit, but on the other hand has business impact. Um, this is not an exercise of, of coolness. You know, we leave that for the academics. Uh, they explore new frontiers and they do amazing stuff. And yes, I think it's cool. But eventually someone, a CFO or a general manager, have to sign off on this. And they'll ask the usual questions. It's the same question they'll ask for any investment. You know, I put X, what am I getting? Whether it's a short-term return or a long-term return, that question is inevitable. So it's a question of addressing, find a good problem to address, but hopefully you're doing that anyway as your organization evolves. And then, if this is a problem that can be addressed with a new technology, all the better. Maybe an older one solves it just as well. And that puts you on the right path. 
So if people ask me where to start, figure out your problems and then find the solutions and, and not the other way around. And, and the rest just, just works as usual. You know, if you've been around long enough, your organization adopted CAD 30, 40 years ago. In this respect, nothing much has changed. Anybody else have anything? Yeah, you know, essentially, we, we have a manufacturing systems group now um, really to address the root of this. It's the convergence of our operational technologies, whether it be our CMMs, our auto drills, uh, Bluetooth torque wrench, those operational technologies with the IT side and bringing that information across, not manually delivering it to a quality person to assess it. It's all about providing those stakeholders the ease of finding the information. And so business case is huge, but the low hanging fruit, like you said, finding those easy things. If you have Bluetooth enabled torque wrenches, you have something right there that you can start looking at to basically use the data and just deliver it in that fashion. Instead of having someone coming in and do a dummy inspection to make sure that it was torqued at the right pounds. Um, there's a lot of things that all of us already have on our floor that we're just not putting together yet that we can embrace from the IoT perspective. So really just look for what you already have on your floor. Is it uh, laser scanners, any of that? They all have this data that can be digitized and then used downstream. So that would be the first place I would ask you to look. Before you decide to go buy some whiz bang um, multi-million dollar piece of you have things in house already that you can leverage to build those low hanging business cases to convince the operators and the management that we should keep going with this. There's benefit to it. Good point. Anybody else? We'll move on to the next. Okay, uh, next one is uh, uh, new technology costs money to implement. So, uh, how do small and medium businesses realize the ROI of this investment long term? That almost sounds like a grenade for you to jump on, George. <laughs> Actually, that's not my question. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, I, um, yeah. I, I, the the low hanging fruit piece again is 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 part of it. But like I said, it's usually uh, like OEE for it. So utilization is probably one of the most common things. No matter whether you're into paper production or whether metal parts production. So I think that that you can. I think that you can utilize at least that as a basic low-hanging fruit. That's pretty common to most people, and it's it's useful. There is a business case for it, right? Then it just comes down to now, how do you go about implementing it? There's a lot of products out there. You can buy pretty highfalutin MES systems that can do a lot of great things for you. How to, The biggest challenge is how do you really trust that ROI that you think you've calculated? <laughs> because that's really kind of a leap of faith, if you will. And I've literally, I've seen companies being presented ROIs for their operations. They clearly state they're gonna save some money, yet they still won't buy the stuff. It's an incredible, it, it's hard to understand why when someone presents a financial ROI, why you would still have a hesitancy to buy something. There's more to it than that. It can't be just that simple math calculation of dollars. There's some other, be it cultural, or be it something that's preventing um, companies from making an investment. As far as the high cost, well, like I said, I think the business models need to change. You know, I'm, I'm yeah. pretty much made that case. You know, but that really comes down to whether you know the, you can sustain a business on a uh, on a uh, service-based type of approach as opposed to a licensing approach. Anybody else have? That? And I picked you because of the... No, it's all good. <laughs> um, maybe I'll add to that. I, I, I think um, it's a cultural thing, um, which comes on top of, of the dollars. Um, and that's looking at it from a composite uh, company perspective is um, talking about, having talked about the different technologies here. And when you see it, it's for... In, in the automotive supply chain, it's easy for suppliers to adopt technologies that are common. And when you are used to uh, pressing, it's easy um, while well, you take a, a thermoplastic material and, and, and press it, 
um, it's easy. But when it comes to something like like uh, fiber placement, it's it's something out of their zone of comfort. And and as soon, even if the technology may be better, um, they won't adopt it because it's out of their comfort zone. And maybe that's the same thing for for all these IT. Um, systems as well. As soon as it's out of their comfort comfort zone, it, it gets culturally difficult. Like that's yeah. fantastic. Okay. Uh, next comment comes in. And, oh, we got off the anonymous people. Doug, <laughs> uh, can you comment on the challenges of transitioning and harmonizing advanced manufacturing processes and equipment into a classified environment? So I, I, I'm going to start out and look towards uh, you, Jeff. And, uh, well, it's going to be uh, similar from the technological point of doing it in non-classified. However, you will have the constraints of the security provisions on top of that. Still have to go through the same, same steps of going through and looking at the different elements that are going to be affected by implementation of that technology. You may still have to program the machines. You may still have to gather data from the machines or the uh, uh, solutions that you implement. Uh, you're just going to be, have to do it in a more restrictive environment and deal with the security classifications. Isolated and hardwired. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say it might somewhat be somewhat easier. Yeah. <laughs> you're, yeah. you're Tara, did you? Yeah. Well, to add to that, um, you know, one thing that we've we tried to make sure that we've done, and you know, we've missed it from here and there, is to bring in our security guys to understand what the equipment does, what kind of, you know, can we use Bluetooth? No. Okay. Well, what about this? If you start at the beginning before you even design your flow, etc. It will make your life a whole lot easier because then, again, if you have equipment on order and then the security guy finds out, oh, well, it has this capability, you've got to get them to take that out because we don't even want it available for someone to flip a switch and turn it on. It can cause havoc into your implementation schedule and then back up your production schedule. So involve the correct security personnel and cybersecurity folks at the start would be my advice. Perhaps make um, to, to Tara's point, the devil's in the details, okay? Classified is a, is a very wide blanket, and information security is a very big word. And for every type of equipment, hardware, software, process, um, the answer is in the details, hence bringing in the experts early on. Um, and, you know, even our own experience working with various levels of, of classified organizations or data, Eventually, uh, the information security team will, will set a bar that you, as the manufacturing or engineering operations, need to meet, and then your vendor will need to meet that. Here, perhaps, uh, Doug, it's, this is not just about uh, defense uh, classification. We see a lot of uh, business, commercial organizations that are very sensitive about their data and their proprietary processes. So these principles will, will certainly apply there uh, really at the same level. Great. A uh, question for Mark, uh, culture change and change management have been mentioned several times. What does that look like? How do you go about actually managing culture change? I'll, I'll take that one. Yeah. Um, I, I have to admit, I drank the Kool-Aid of change management, culture management, and change after I heard uh, Rick Maurer um, give a presentation one time. He, he has a book, and he's not paying me as an employee on saying this name. So don't tell him either. He'll ask me for a check. Um, that basically 60% of change initiatives, equipment change in production environment fail because you've missed one of the critical things. One, identifying your stakeholders and understanding what their pain points are, putting yourself in their shoes to get them on board. If the workforce and the management doesn't understand why a change is even needed, again, what business issue are you trying to address and do it the right way? they're never going to buy in. And then those people are going to be the naysayers in the meetings. They may not raise their hand, they may kind of nod in the meeting, but as soon as they walk out that door, they're going to say, man, this is the dumbest thing we've ever done. Why are we wasting this money? 
I know most of us have been in meetings like that, and so you know what I'm talking about. Um, you have to get those folks engaged. The next step is then you get started. Until you get those people on board, you're going to mess up if you go ahead and plow through it, like you guys were saying. A lot of times, new initiatives, you know, we all kind of have the shooks, oh, this is the latest initiative, you know, be it from HR or IT or security, whatever. And we all kind of joke about it. Well, the thing is, is that they never got everybody's buy-in yet. So there's questions, there's resistance. So you, after you get everybody's buy-in that you need, then you get started. You keep communicating the entire time that you're developing the technology, implementing the technology. And then when you actually start rolling it out, the group, like for example, Mantech, they don't walk away. It's not like getting a forklift out of a crate and then letting someone drive off with it. Everything we do is much more complicated. There's processes that have to be written and the software and training manuals, um, electronic work instructions, and then there's optimization after that. So you have to continue with that change. You can't just throw it over the fence. And then you have to assess it. Sometimes there's a point where it's like, we need to just stop this, you know, or there's times where you just have to keep people engaged and make sure that they're willing to carry on the activity. And with all of this, it, that sh it's not going to be a one and done. If we just hook up some equipment and put some data somewhere where an analyst can do something, we're wasting our time and money and not getting what we can. We're really going to be surpassed in the global economy if that's the attitude we take. We really have to embrace the change. So, uh, Mark, if you want to talk to me after the um, panel, I'll give you some names of some books that I've read. They are all, in my opinion, honestly, it's all common sense. But damn it, we're humans, and we're like, oh yeah, we got this, we just do it, and then we forget. And then we stop doing it, and we wonder why it doesn't work. Um, having a process for common sense seems ridiculous, but we really need to do it, and that's the whole change management. Get that procedure written now. Yeah, common sense needs to be documented. Any other comments? Okay, I'm going to go a little bit out of order because I like this uh, next question. Um, if a company invests in the wrong manufacturing 4.0 technology, doesn't meet the requirements, whatever, uh, at what point do you admit failure and start over? <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> Thank you. The, uh, well, first of all, how do you know that you failed? Okay, uh, and, and at what point do you recognize that? Um, go back. You know, what have you been trying to achieve? And for our collective comments earlier, there must be some measured factor here. Okay, some KPI. I was trying to increase my throughput. I was trying to improve my first time quality, I was trying to, whatever the KPI may be. Um, in the context of this discussion, I would throw in another KPI in terms of the user adoption and, and their ability to use the system. But um, yeah, I mean, some, some efforts inevitably um, will fail. And then you will know how it happened and when it happened and, and different organizations uh, do a better job debriefing these failures and, and learning from them. But um, you know, what do you do? Yeah, you, you, you may have to start over, or you may have to just fine tune. Um, but at the end of the day, there's an element here of a journey. And our recommendation you know, to, to the world, to, to our clients, is, is not to go all out, because then the failure could be very substantial. And, and the money is less the issue. I think it's the loss of trust of the organization and, and these kind of technologies. And that sets back the organization um, a lot. Um, there's an element of, of risk averseness, I think, in aerospace, so, or with all of us here. Um, and often people make a decision not to do anything. But uh, doing nothing is also a decision <laughs> that is made, whether you're aware of that or not. So then you've done nothing, and then how do you know that you failed? Right? So there's failure in doing nothing as well. And, and we see out there and a survey we even did last year with SME about technology adoption, there's a very clear correlation between the market leaders in their respective segments and, and their tendency to be out there and try. And when you try, ultimately sometimes you will fail. And how do you know you fail? Well, what have you been trying to do? And then fix it 
or do it again. Um, the research broadly shows, specifically if we're looking at these recent technologies, Industry 4.0, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and different companies have different um, meanings for that. But research published broadly by companies like Deloitte and McKinsey and, and otherwise show that uh, early adoption of this technology is actually accelerating business growth, while secondary, the followers, actually have it harder. So there is an element here of trial, there is an element here of groundbreaking technologies, but when you jump in, you, you better know what you're looking for, otherwise you'll get lost very quickly. I, I'd George, like, you look I'd like to add something to that. Is um, It's actually an extremely good question, because the real answer to that is you don't want to be in that position <clears throat> to begin with. And unfortunately, that's it. I mean, if you really did fail, you don't know if you did, because there's probably capability in there that you can use, but you just don't know it. But if it really is an abject failure, you have no choice. You gotta start again. The point is not to get into that position. And one of the reasons we went down the path that we went was the small business guy is has to be de-risked almost to the point where even if he did have to start over, the investment is so minimal that it's really not gonna knock him off the So one of the things that we did when we laid out this automation cell in order to do this demonstration is we realized that when you go and Google automation, usually you'll see a machine with a robot in front of it with a fence around it, <clears throat> or you'll see a robot in the middle with a bunch of machines around it and a fence around it. So you're, you're reliant on high volume contracts in order to keep the utilization on that equipment to maximum potential, right? Well, the way that we laid it out is we took advantage of the fact that the equipment manufacturers are trying to sell multi-pallet changers and add-on options. And by doing that, they've created a different access point into the workspace of the machine. So we took advantage of that and said, oh, great. So we'll get this Mori machine, this Haas machine, and this Mazak machine that all have bolt-on options, but we didn't buy the options. We just used the access point. So we put a rail system and an ABB robot and basically 10 through that port. So the idea here is the fence is on the back side of the machine. Mm -hmm. So the small business guy, if he's not getting high volume contracts, he can literally walk up to that machine, open a door, work two or three prototypes, 20 prototypes, whatever he feels like, and walks away, never crosses a fence, and never deals with a robot or any automation issue. Which means he can put that machine under full utilization without any high volume automation contracts. But then if he does happen to get something where there's 2,000, 5,000, you know, lots of pieces of the same thing, he now has the option of using the tender robot on the same machine. So that little step de-risked it a lot because now the small business guy is going to be more likely to say, yeah, I think I can do that because I know if you guys screw up and you don't have automation contracts for me, I can still run my normal business through these machines. It's little things like that and keeping the cost low and so forth. And I think if you de-risk it to the point, you'll have a lot less reluctance in getting jumping into that automation bandwagon and the IoT bandwagon. Excellent. So um, uh, that actually kind of leads into uh, the next question. I'm gonna combine two of these. You know, given how we talk about de-risking for small businesses and given how uh, risk averse the aerospace companies can be, uh, and with all these new technologies coming out, uh, I'm just wanting to start with you. Uh, uh, how do you balance the business goals that you have with uh, against the innovation acceleration? How do we balance? Did that, so, how do you uh, balance your business goals against innovation acceleration, considering the risk? Oh, that's a tough question. <laughs> <laughs> um, It's um, uh, it's quite a challenge because of you. Of course, you wanna you wanna be innovative. You wanna be at the at the forefront of technology. Um, but um, it's it's from 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 our perspective internally, it is um, it's always a question: uh, Is it going to be? Um, adopted throughout the organization that's something we look at um, or is it just uh, um, yeah that, that that that's that 
a very important criterion. And the other is when, when we look to the outside, um, how do we deal with new technologies? It is, of course, is there a business case behind it? So that's, that's these are the two dimensions there. Internally, um, I think it's, on, on the outside, it's, I tend to say it's easier because you can come up with a, put some dollars on it, but internally it is, um, it's, 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 it's more difficult and uh, um, yeah, I have to admit I don't, internally I, I don't really don't have a, a straightforward answer. Mm -hmm. um, so when you guys were going, uh, uh, you obviously made a big commitment when you went to doing uh, automotive composites. Uh, was that just a, a leap of faith that you guys went through, or what, what was the process by you made that? Decision? Well, the, the, the process for that, for such things, is, is of course we have a we have a very thorough product development process. Like um, Jeffrey mentioned, also the like like the um, TRL or MRL processes. We have something which comes from the automotive industry. We have that in place. We go through the. Um, the different uh, process phases and all of this. Uh, there, of course, are evaluations upfront, so you don't run into issues there. That's that's uh, that's clearly defined. When we do try to change the manufacturing, the operation setup, and the, the mentality there, what we did is we we implemented a, a joint a company-wide operations management system really to um, to uh, prepare the ground for future initiatives and we have um, in, in all the different sites numerous operation uh, excellence managers who work together and exchange such ideas and work together on such projects I think that is a, um, a driver there that's how we tackle that a similar process with Boeing? Sure, I think a lot depends on how much time you have. If you want to take on a new technology risk or, or opportunity, how far can you take it before you have to revert to your plan B or next best option? Of course, you're applying uh, good risk mitigation processes and looking at maturity levels, readiness levels, but at some point, if the technology is not going to meet the time frame that you need for uh, new product introduction or supporting a production system, we need to be able to move down a different off-ramp or go to a different solution. So much for us is how much time do we have? We've done this on a number of technologies. If they're not going to come home in time, we need to move to an alternate. Great. Uh, we're going to be Closing up here, we're running out a little out of time, and I'm not sure I'm going to get through all the questions. Um, but let's go ahead and take this next one. Uh, again, it's uh, how do facilities like SGL's FEC enable harmonization implementation to occur without biasing decisions, uh, you know, for equipment or manufacturers? I guess how, how are you looking at the, uh, the whole space before you commit? Um. We, we are, uh, um, um, we don't, because the, the partners, the machinery and equipment suppliers are, are partners in the final placement center, uh, we have no interest at all at, at any, preferring any of the suppliers there. Um, our our um, benefit at the end of the day is um, to supply the materials uh, to any solution that that is the appropriate solution so we want um, together with Crown offer to come up with a with a pass forward for the uh, um, for the um, customer partner uh, that that allows for a um, working solution at the end of the day and so we don't care about which machinery and equipment is being used it's it's, it's really about um is the product gonna work and, and that's what it's about so it's much more than just comparing two 
um, pieces of equipment here. It's really, as I try to point out this morning, it's when you look at the different solutions, how, how do you, uh, what does the part look like at the end of the day? Is that a, is that a metal part or is that a hybrid uh, um, 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 composite part? It's, it's really the, the solution must work at the end of the day and that's what it's about. So again, we don't, we don't have any preference there. Um, it's, and um, if, if we have the doohickey solution, but it, it, it won't work, it doesn't make sense. So it's, it's, it's really, we want to, um, together with the customer, that, that the customer is successful, whatever, whatever the it equipment is. So the, uh, I'm going to open that up a little bit. Uh, I know it was addressed specifically to SGL, but uh, all of your companies have preferred suppliers. How do you bring in new innovation? Does your procurement agency force you into using those preferred suppliers, or do you, is there an ability to, to, to go outside that? I'll, I'll take that one. So. Yes, we all have preferred suppliers, but especially in the IoT range, there are so many new companies coming up um, that, for example, last year we sent out an RFI about IoT platforms, got 15 responses. And then we started getting calls from Amazon, a, was it AWS Greengrass. They have a solution now, and that got everybody's attention. We're like, let's do another one. 10 new companies were added to that list. So yes, we have SAP files, Apple files, and then we have the Siemens people that really love Siemens. But one thing that we have found is that we use, we call it INAR, an independent non-advocate review of these types of technologies. So we have a bake-off. What does this one do, this one do, based against our requirements. And then we have people who have not been the ones assessing those technologies, but know enough that they can make a valid assessment of it to come in. That way, there's no internal bias of like, oh, well, I work with Doug, and I've worked with him for years, and he's a great guy, I know his family. Their product meets all of our requirements. Well, that might be very true, but they're looking at nuances at that point if everybody's on equal footing. So that's the process that we use today. Okay. I think we're almost out of time. Well, we are out of time. I just want to give the opportunity for everybody to make a last comment, if you like, Andres. Yeah, as I think all said, the most important thing is really uh, bring, bring involve, involve the people um, and, and prepare for the change. Otherwise, you will not insert new technologies with them your corporation. It's, it's, uh, don't be people agnostic, you may be technology agnostic, but not. you have to involve the people there, otherwise you won't think. George? Yeah, I, I just think that it's extremely important that we get that small business space backbone uh, connected. Um, yeah, we're talking about change management, and, and I 100% agree with the need to get everyone in early, uh, for sure but implied here that there is change. So uh, there is a, there's a wave of new technology. Uh, it needs to be evaluated and applied. It drives business value. And that's, that's a very good stepping point from our experience. I think it's very important to engage all of our stakeholders as early as possible and follow a systematic and disciplined process towards introducing new technology into our production systems. And I'd like you guys to know um, that this is not easy. If it was, we wouldn't be having a panel on this. We wouldn't have done a survey. So don't get discouraged. It's not going to be zero to 60. Find those little victories, um, the soup low hanging fruit, the business cases that are enough to help gain some support within your organization. Um, and that'll be the foundational point that you guys can really jump off of. And, and Go as far as you want. You don't have to hook up every system you have in your factory. That's not necessary. So do it where it makes sense. Fantastic. So uh, with that, I'd like to. Uh...